I am what in the conference biz they call a pacer, which means I pace. And um, there's something epic going on here because I can pace all the way from here <laughs> to that upper column, which um, Okay, anyway, hi, I'm Michael Lopp, and let's get this started. There's so many screens, I don't even know where to like center on, so I'm gonna center on right here, okay? Sorry about the column guys in the south room. Um, we're gonna do this now. You ready? Here we go. Okay, all right. Humans are bad. <laughs> Humans are bad. What the hell happened here, people? This is a plug. Let me tell you what a plug is. A plug takes energy from here and puts it over there. And what you're seeing here is, I forget how many are here. There's are 17. There's 17 different plugs that do exactly the same thing. They move energy from point A to point B. Look at this. This is a mess. This is a design mess. Now. There are good reasons for each of these plugs. For example, the one from Britain, which I forget where it is on here, is there and it was designed using materials that were available at the time during World War II. They had a brass shortage, so they said, we're going to have this kind of plug. But this is, a, this is tw how many of you ever designs doing exactly the same thing? What happened here? Let's make it worse. Here are these plugs that I just showed you um, <clears throat> around the world. So if you go and look at this, you know, USA is pretty good. Uh, uh, Russia looks like they've got one. But here's an interesting one. If you go look down and what is that? Is it El Salvador right in the middle there? There are 10 different plugs in play. I mean, if you're wandering around El Salvador with your MacBook, you probably have to have like 10 adapters going on there. What the hell happened here? Why did we end up with this huge diversity of plugs? Okay, that's too many plugs. We can't talk about all of those plugs. So let's just talk about one plug. <laughs> remember this event? You remember this event. There was this event, I think, believe Steve was still alive. I forget who was doing it. But they got up and they wandered on stage. And we, How many of you have this plug on you right now? Right? How many of you have multiple versions of this plug in your house? Exactly. They're all over the place. So they're a blight. But, <laughs> but the thing was, we were all sitting in that keynote years ago, and we were up there, and they were like, hey, this plug is now this plug. <laughs> and I went, oh, shit, I have to buy everything again, and it's all because of this damn plug. Was it worth it or not? I want to I talk about the decision behind this plug, but I also want to talk, and more importantly, I want to talk about the people that make these decisions. I want to talk about stables and volatiles. I'm Rands. I'm this guy on Twitter that sounds like a, a fortune cookie. I was, um, I was at Apple for eight and a half years. I ran the Apple store, and I ran part of the Mac OS X team. I worked at this creepy place for four years, um, and now I'm the head of engineering at Pinterest, which is an interesting contrast between two companies. Um, I am this guy on the internet. I tweet things. I wrote a couple of books, one about uh, leadership for engineers, another one about a career handbook for engineers. And there's some themes that kind of are relevant to the stables and volatiles talk that come out of these books that I want to start with. Um, number one is, um, these are some of my favorite lines. You're in a hurry. You're in a hurry. I've seen a lot of, um, I've seen a lot of uh, resumes over my life, over my career, and I, when I, whenever I look at them, I am reminded how quickly we in engineering and high tech move between jobs. <clears throat> You're in a hurry. You're three years away, in my opinion, from your brand new gig. You could be very happy with what you're doing right now, but what I've seen is every three years, we tend to throw everything up and change our gigs. Why do we do that? Why does our gig have this expiration date? It's because we get bored super easily. We're high stim creatures. We like to figure things out. And as soon as we actually figure things out, as soon as the flow chart reveals itself, as soon as the people and the politics and the products become obvious, we tend to go and switch our gigs. I, my wife, I was at Apple for eight and a half years, and Apple was still doing pretty well. And we were having a chat, and I was telling her, I'm like, hey, honey, um, 
kind of getting bored. And she just went ashen. And in her head, she's like, oh, God, not this again. Because she knows what's coming. She knows that I'm about to just be like, hey, it's Apple. It's doing great. But I want to go do this thing at this company called Palantir that no one's ever heard of. And it's all these engineers. And they're doing amazing things. Your gig has an expiration date. There's a, you, have a certain, you have a certain amount of time before you're going to do this next thing. The other thing I want you to think about, how many of you have done a 1.0 in your life? Was it easy? Did it suck? <laughs> It's really, really hard. It's really, it's really exciting, but it's incredibly hard because you're making all of these decisions um, for the first time. You're making all of the decisions. You're bringing something brand new into the world. 1.0 is going to kill you. Starting to do something new for the first time is an incredibly hard experience. It's a good thing to go do after you've done something for three years. The other thing is, um, I don't know how to use Keynote, which is ironic. <laughs> the other thing is... <laughs> Um, around this word here, when I hear that, when, when you say disruption, I hear someone or something is about to go eat my lunch. This is sort of a, um, this is sort of a marketing word these days. You know, Uber is disrupting taxis. We're it, throwing it out there like it's this new thing that's been going on. It doesn't mean much of anything other than people are really working hard to invent new things. But people are saying it right now like it's something new. But the thing about it is it's been going on for decades. This is a postcard of the Silicon Valley. <laughs> In, I'm not sure what year it is, many, many years ago. Um, blossoms, California poppies. It's beautiful. Isn't it gorgeous? We, did, we took that and we turned it into this. <laughs> 1,854 square miles, 3 million souls, incredible nerd density. <laughs> and a very unique culture, which I think is not just in the Silicon Valley, it's here, it's in a lot of different places. And as we talk about stables and volatiles, I want to give you a little bit of history about um, the culture that got created, because it got created a lot many years ago. How many of you, show of hands, I always wonder how many people can know the answer to this question. How many of you know who William Shockley is? Who is he? The Nobel Prize winning inventor of the transistor. There's a lot of transistors in this room right now. <laughs> a whole crap load. Um, he, um, he invented the transistor. And um, he was a really awful human being, by the way. <laughs> We'll talk more about that in a second. But he did give us the transistor, which is kind of awesome, right? So he took this, he took this ego, he took this uh, transistor thing, and he went to a lab in um, Palo Alto, a garage, if you will, in Palo Alto. And he said, hey, I invented the transistor. And what he did is he attracted an incredible amount of engineers around him because the dude invented the transistor. But the thing about it was, and the thing that's really interesting about this, about him, is he was an awful manager. This is a horrible person. He's actually a racist, too, but that's a whole other topic. This is a really, really bad human being. <clears throat> and his erratic behavior, his personality, his morals, um, caused a group of folks to leave. They're called the Traitorous Eight. And they left after one year to found companies like Fairchild Semiconductor and Intel. And, um, but more, which is amazing, right? This is, this is an amazing business that they created. But the other thing that they created, which is far more interesting to me as nerd culture, nerd whisperer guy, is they hated this guy so much that they said, we're going to do everything differently because this was an awful experience. We moved from the East Coast to where we lived out here to the West Coast. It's very nice out here, but we're going to go do things completely differently. So they got rid of titles. They got rid of a dress code and ties. Not completely. They got rid of the reserved parking lots. They got rid of, they had everyone in an open workspace. Does this sounding familiar? <clears throat> it was called an egalitarian, egalitarian workplace is what they were going for. And um, I like to think he's the reason you're sitting here wearing flip-flops. Any flip-flops in the room right now? In the back, all right. This tests better on the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But he's the reason, we did this awful human being, this is the reason we're all sitting here, well, I'm in a button-up shirt, we're all in t-shirts, and we're hanging out, and we're wearing whatever we want. We have these open spaces that we work in. <clears throat> There's things that came out of this that we still hold true in a lot of our engineering culture. For example, a flat organization. They wanted to keep it really, really flat. This is something that's still going on at Apple, which is a bajillion people right now. But we knew the teams that, keep, that Steve cared about at Apple, because he had three levels of management. And it was Steve, who was a VP, director, uh, lead of leads, manager, and people. That's three levels of management, which sounds like a lot. But anyone from IBM here? <laughs> really, actually, is there anyone from IBM here? Because I'm going to be making fun of you in about 20 minutes. <laughs> Go on. I see you in the back. I apologize right now. Okay, cool. <laughs> really flat. I mean, it's three levels of management. That like, sounds like a lot, but if you've been anywhere of a large company, that's not actually that much. You can, we, we built the same model at Palantir, three levels of leadership. It can go out to, we can fan that out to like 5,000 people and still keep, keep it kind of flat. Flat organization accelerates the flow of information. It's anti-bureaucracy, hopefully. And it fosters the intellectual process by allowing us to cross-pollinate easier. The other thing we got out of this, this reaction to Shockley, speed. With this free-flowing information, with these flat organizations, you get faster decisions, hopefully, better decisions, hopefully, and products get to market faster. And you get the collaboration piece, the idea, the best idea winning. This is one of the things I love about engineers, something at Palantir that I love dearly. It's like I came in with all of this gray hair and all of these punks who are awesome. <laughs> and they didn't believe a word I said. And I said, hey, Palantir, we did, I mean, at Apple, we did this. They said, why? I'm like, well, because, um, I don't know, I saw it 20 times and it worked this way. They're like, why? I'm like, all right, so I have to go sit there and go up to the whiteboard and do the math and all this sort of thing. They force us, they force us to explain our decisions regardless of what our titles are. And the other thing is having a results orientation, like I just said. It's not about what your title is. It's not about whether you've written books or not. It's like, what value have you created? HR, are you in the room? Would you raise your hand if you are here? I don't think you would. <laughs> HR, sorry HR if you're here or in the other room, hello. <laughs> the problem that we have as engineers with HR is, and this is, not a this is a generalization, but there's lovely HR people out there, is we don't understand as engineers how they inherited that power. They just kind of show up sometimes and you get this smell of like, is someone getting fired? Why? What's going on there, right? <laughs> It's strange, I and mean, we're laughing about it, but it's not really a pleasant experience. But that's our problem, not with HR, with these teams where we're like, explain to me the value that you're creating. And it's not, it's not a judgy question, it's just I want to know the facts about why you can do this thing and why I think it, you're the Grim Reaper. Anyway, <clears throat> at, at Palantir, we had this hiring criteria, which I called the second test. It was a really, if you guys don't know Palantir, we had a very high hiring bar. We aspired to be Apple from, you know, about a decade, sorry, a Google from about a decade ago, where the bar was really, really high. And we wanted to keep it really high. But that was only half of it. That was the first test. Could you get hired at this very, uh, at this company with a very high hiring bar? There was a second test too. And it wasn't written down anywhere. It was, you got hired, congratulations. But you had to, um, Build something of value. Um, no one would tell you to actually go do this. They wouldn't tell you what it was. And um, they, it had to be recognized as valuable by the rest of the organism. And we didn't quite trust you until you identified a piece of work, built it, and the rest of the company said, ooh, that was valuable. It's the second test. We didn't actually trust you as an engineer, whether you'd written books or had a million Twitter followers on Twitter or anything, until you actually created some value. Results orientation. It's the Zuckerberg era. This is why we're wearing hoodies, why we're wearing shoes, flip-flops, whatever. It's this era of, you know, hey, engineers are running the show. We kind of are. Dropbox, Google, Palantir, other companies, CEOs are engineers. It's just fascinating to me. But the thing about it is that it started a long time ago in this reaction to this awful human, human being. We're risk takers. We have a high tolerance for risk. One in 10 startups are successful. If I told you it was a 90% chance that you're gonna walk out of this building and get hit by lightning, you would stay in the building, right? One in 10 do it. Why would we do this? What is, 
interesting about failing 90% of the time. <clears throat> we as engineers, we assume it's going to fail. This is our starting mindset. We gave ourselves permission to fail, right? Because we know something very important about failure. We know we're going to learn something even if it comes crashing down. This is one of my favorite shots from um, Palantir. This is uh, Gary Kasparov. He's playing speed chess. He's a chess master against my entire engineering team. So there's this table that comes out here and it goes all the way over here. Look at me pacing. And it goes all the way back over here. And he's just going around and he's crushing them. <laughs> he's just knocking them out. And there's some pretty smart people at this company, a lot of talented engineers. He's just killing them. <clears throat> but the thing about it, the thing I like about this photo has nothing to do with Gary, well, it has something to do with Gary Casper. It has to do with these people behind there. You see them? What are they doing? <laughs> They're delighted. They're happy. They're happy they just got their asses handed to them by the master. They're learning. They're sitting there watching, and they're watching their friends get beaten up as well. But they're, all <laughs> but they're sitting there and learning. I failed, but I'm learning as I'm sitting here watching my other, all of my friends, all of my cohorts actually fail. It's amazing to me. And here's the thing, and what is the longest introduction to a, a presentation ever, there's a spectrum to these engineers. There's stables, and there's volatiles. Told you it was a big intro. And to introduce this, once more, I want to talk to you about a guy named Steven. Um, Steven was a contractor at my first startup before I went to Apple. And he, uh, we hired him to come clean up some disaster in our, in our database layer. And we said, hey, come in three months, fix this thing, please. Um, Steven walked into the building, and he's like, what's that smell? It's not HR. What's that smell? That smell is this team is never going to ship anything. Hired as a contractor to do database work. Well-defined box. Go over in your box, fix your stuff. Walked in and said, these guys are never going to do anything. So he walked around a little bit, and he said, um, Stu, your name's Stu now, sorry. Stu, who was an intern and was just happy to be here. He said, Stu, you and I are going to go into the ping pong room and we're going to work on this product until it's done. And Stu's like, sweet. Wait, one question. <laughs> what does done mean? And Stephen's like, Stephen's like, I don't know. We'll figure out when we get there. So he grabbed this guy. No one told him to do this. He grabbed Stu. They went into the ping pong room and they just started working. Now, two weeks later, Two or three weeks later, the ping pong reeked. Ping pong room just smelled. It was Stu in there. It was Steven was in there. There was a four or five other engineers in there. And the rest of the company came in three weeks later. And they demoed the product working, like really working. And we were like, holy crap. Now, the product manager on this whole situation of the product that was never going to ship was saying we're about three months away from shipping. And they did it in three weeks. And we clapped. He said, this is amazing. It's working. Everyone was clapping. You can actually see it working for the first time. There was a couple of people in the room that were not clapping. And they were engineers. And they knew who Steven was. They knew that, yes, it was working. Yes, it was a good morale boost and awesome. Look at the product working. But they knew that Steven had probably cut some corners. <laughs> to get that thing done. He probably decided to say, hey, you know, uh, performance probably doesn't matter because we never ship. Who cares? It doesn't need to perform. And these folks who were not clapping were correct. They knew that Steven was because they'd seen him before. He's a volatile. And I want to explain who these folks are. We knew he was a volatile. He got it done. It was an amazing feat of work. But a year later, when Stephen was gone, by the way, because he moved on to whatever else was bright and shiny, he, we were, had our first big customer, threw a lot of load at it, and it came crumbling down. He was a volatile. These are archetypes I'm going to talk about now. You're going to start identifying with one or the other. Chances are all of you in here are a little bit of both. So these are archetypes. I'm going to speak about them as archetypes, but it's not black and white. Super clear. Stables are these lovely, lovely engineers who happily work together with direction. They appreciate there appears to be a plan. They like schedules. 
They play nice with, the, with others. They value efficiently run, no drama teams. These people are great. They calmly assess risks. They carefully work to mitigate failure, however distant or improbable it might be. They tend to generate process, which a lot of us engineers don't like. It's a seven letter word that begins with P. And this, because they know the process creates predictability and measurability. Awesome folks. They make good and predictable decisions. They are predictable people. The way stables make decisions has a lot to do with how they think. There's a research that shows if a consumer is given a choice between a good $20 toaster and a somewhat better $30 toaster, they'll choose, they'll choose that $20 toaster. Make sense? I only need two slices, I don't need four, I don't want to spend another $10, done. But here's where it gets really interesting. If you put in a marginally superior toaster into the mix, this $50 toaster, which has some set of attributes that make it worth $50, the exact same person will go and start doing this. And they'll buy the $30 toaster, which is interesting to me. It's called salience in decision making, which is a fancy word for one's attention uh, being differentially directed towards one portion of their environment. Um, in this case, what they're doing is they're, ba they're basing it on all the, all, all, they're basing it a nice stable decision on um, the most recent information. It's a very stable thing that they do. And I just realized, I have sound by the way. <laughs> Surprise! Um, you're gonna have to imagine the sound here in a second. That's what they do, it's a very stable decision. That's what they're doing there. Volatiles are on the other end of the uh, spectrum here. They are, um, they prefer to define strategy rather than to follow it. They um, can't conceive of failing. <coughs> they um, find a thrill in risk. They often don't build predictable or stable things, but they sure build a lot of them. They annoyingly are often only reliable if it's in their best interest. <clears throat> One of the ways I've learned how to motivate um, volatiles over my career is I walk up and say, hey Stu, you're volatile now. <laughs> hey, um, Mark is doing this thing. I'm it's impossible, you couldn't do it by the way. Um, but Mark's working on this thing that I know you couldn't do and um, work, it's really, really, really hard. It's gonna take a while, I don't think you can do it. I know you can't do it, <clears throat> but Mark can. Um, I know you don't really like Mark that much, but I, I'm giving him this, it's really hard and you can't do it. <laughs> Who is this Mark? <laughs> Where is this Mark guy? <laughs> um, that's a good way to mull, it's kind of douchebag, but it's kind of a good way to mull, 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 manage those uh, volatiles. Anyway, they see working with others as, these volatiles as time consuming and onerous. They prefer to walk, work in small autonomous teams. They're kind of jerks. <laughs> <laughs> they see working with others as time consuming it, it, and they could care less how you feel. Now, they don't actually not care how you feel, it's just on the list of things they care about, it's low. <laughs> they prioritize your feelings as number seven after all of these other things. They're jerks. <clears throat> if you go and take a volatile and you throw a little toaster test at them, um, <clears throat> if you go throw a, throw a little toaster at them, if you give them a choice between a $20 toaster or a $30 toaster, what they usually choose is flying toasters. <laughs> Sorry, you guys can't hear this in the other room. There's this little march going on here, but you can see what is going on here. This is the, how many of you know this piece of software? <sighs> Excellent, my people, awesome. <laughs> I did this talk like a couple of months ago and no one raised their hand. I'm like, where am I? What's going on? <laughs> okay, what's going on here? 
sometimes we want our toasters to fly, don't we? Right? <laughs> this is absurd. <laughs> this is clearly a volatile at work. <laughs> this is clearly a volatile at work. You could stare at it for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, the company that did this was a company called After Dark. Berkeley Systems. This is called After Dark. The company was called Berkeley Systems. And um, they made millions of dollars on this. Let's actually let's take it a different way. Stu, you're now a VC. Okay. Here we go. Stu, I'm gonna pitch you on something here. All right. <clears throat> Here's the idea. Here's the pitch. You ready? Don't I know it's it's awesome. Don't I'm just hold on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm idea for some software that we're going to do here, okay? And it's software that's only going to be useful when you're not there. <laughs> Wait, hold on. I know, it's, I know it's good, right? So when you're not there, this really cool thing is going to happen to your computer. Um, hold on. Wait for it. These toasters <laughs> are going to show up on your screen, and they're going to fly. Right. I know. Awesome. Don't write the check yet. Hold on. <laughs> but there's more. There's more. There's going to be toasters and toast. And you are, there's going to be a preference where you can change the color of the toast. Like you want dark toast or light toast, right? So you want to invest in this idea? Is this amazing? I know you do. Don't, you don't have to tell me. Um, they make millions of dollars on this. This is a stupid idea. They made millions of dollars on this. They made millions of dollars on this. On software, which is there to save your screen, which means you're not there. Yes, you look at it and it's pretty or not. But like, take this apart for a second here. Take, it's absurd. This is absurd. Millions of dollars. It's brilliant. So as I was putting together, <laughs> as I was putting together this talk, I, I'm like, I, I, was, I, I realized there was this toaster theme that was working into the talk, and I realized flying toasters would fit in here nicely. And I started to wonder, I'm like, hmm, who was behind this brilliant, absurd, multi-million dollar idea? And it turns out it's two folks named um, Wes Boyd and Joan Blaze. What they did after uh, Sierra, uh, Sierra Systems bought Berkeley Systems is they went on to do MoveOn.org. If you don't know what this is, it's a politically left um, technology action group. They, this is years ago. This is very early internet. They decided we're going to go change the course, the discourse around politics via the web. I don't know these folks. I guarantee you, they're volatiles. There's some problems that we have with our archetypes here, our volatiles and our stables. Um, there's some allergic reactions between these folks. It is important to note that these guys and gals hate each other. <laughs> archetypes, remember? We're talking about archetypes. They really hate each other. The volatiles believe the stables are slow, they're lazy, they're political, they're workflow based, they're process creators, they're bureaucrats. <clears throat> the stables believe the volatiles hold nothing sacred, they do whatever the hell they want. Company, team, product, be damned. They have this intense knee, negative knee-jerk reaction about each other. And here's the bad news. Everyone's right. This reaction that they're having is because they have these totally different value systems, right? <clears throat> they're going to fight. These teams are going to fight. There's going to be healthy and sometimes unhealthy tension between these two archetypes. Second, if you're going to build a company that is going to thrive, you need to figure out how to get these two parties, these two locker archetypes, to actually work together. A lot of companies, I've watched them unintentionally kill their volatiles. Kill, it's a big word. There's this reward for shipping 1.0, and it's a bit of a curse, and I want to give you a little cautionary tale. <clears throat> Stu, God, I'm picking on you the entire time, sorry. Um, <laughs> Stu and I, we do a startup, and we get the 1.0 thing done. Um, just like other companies that I've worked at before, we got a 1.0 done. Like Borland, I was at Borland, I was at Netscape, and I was at Apple. Each of these companies had a 1.0, whether it was, how many of you remember Borland? Borland? Oh my God, my people, this is great. <laughs> um, Borland, some of the 
They're 1.0 with these beautiful integrated development environments, Turbo Pascal, all of these wonderful 1.0 products. The first 1.0 with Netscape, obviously, was the browser, and then there was Apple, which obviously was the, the Mac, uh, the Apple II. And each of these companies, and Stu and I, we each had this idea that we're going to bring this new thing into the world. And um, for each of these companies, they did it. And it was incredibly flipping hard. They brought it out. But what they did when they did that is the, each of these have a, comp have a, state, have a volatile. Borland, Philippe Kahn, Netscape, uh, Mark Andreessen, Apple, Steve Jobs, obviously. Each of them had um, this, this 1.0 that they created. And it was war. And it was battle to get it actually out the door. And what happens is, once they get it out the door, there's this very interesting thing that happens after 1.0 gets out, is volatiles sometimes become these stables, folks. The volatiles who win slowly become stables because they start protecting the crown jewels. They say, listen, um, this is an important thing. This is the cash cow. These are the crown jewels. We want to have this. We want to protect this thing. This is what happens after that is other volatiles show up in these companies and they get hired because they can smell the volatility that's going on. They want to be part of something that's brand new. And they start to do what volatiles do, which is everything I just explained. And it starts to piss off the established volatiles. It starts to really annoy them because they're protecting the crown jewels. And the vol they go to these new volatiles and they say, hey, stop doing that thing that you're doing. We got a 1.0 here. It's worth protecting. I have the scars. You don't want a piece of this. 1.0 is awful. This is a great way for companies to coast and to die, is when they're sitting there no longer in vol in vol investing in these volatiles, who are jerks, by the way. It's really lots of reasons to get them out the door. Now. I'm going to say something, you might be mad at me. What a yard sale of mediocrity. <laughs> All right, we'll call it a win. We'll call it a win. I did a conference once that IBM was sponsoring, and I said that, and it was silence. <laughs> My God, this line normally kills. What's going on here? Oh, IBM in back. What a yard sale of mediocrity. Now, you cannot argue for a second these companies are amazingly successful. You cannot argue for a second. These are the market caps as of yesterday. 181 billion, 200 billion, 70 billion. <clears throat> but what's going on here? My question to you is go look at these companies and tell me something that they've built that's inspired you. Something that you can point at and say, wow, Oracle, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> now, they're successful businesses, absolutely, but I would say most of the volatiles have left. MBAs, are you in the room? No, no there's one right there. <laughs> the MBAs are running the show. Good luck. That's awesome. Good job. Lots of numbers. They're spreadsheets. It's great. Um, <laughs> they're doing well, but they're, no long, they're definitely product companies, but they're not inspired companies anymore. And there's a, hundreds of thousands of people working there who are incredibly happy and employed. Go job. You go, back, you go back to here, and you can see what happened in this case. They were successful. They made it through. They had their 1.0, but then they kind of flatlined. These companies, most of these companies, didn't make it. Only one did. Borland, they killed the volatile. Um, Philippe Kahn, uh, Borland win Microsoft, battle with Microsoft. Microsoft won. Borland still exists as this enterprise something something thing. But it's interesting. Philippe Kahn, you know what he did after Borland? Anyone know? It's in your pocket. He invented a thing called a camera phone. What? <laughs> Did you know that? I, that's a big, he invented the camera phone. He left here, licked his wound, and then he invented that camera that's sitting on your phone right now. That's the guy, volatile. Netscape got bought by AOL, which is a fate worse than death. Um, <laughs> they're gone. Although, it's really interesting because there's this thing called Firefox which is based on a, a Mozilla, which is, you want to know who the volatile player is? A guy named JWZ. 
and he's the one of the original volatiles. And what you're seeing with Firefox is one person, one volatile, who said, screw this noise, I'm going to go do it somewhere else. And then you have Apple, which almost died. They got rid of their volatile. They fired him. And they went in and they turned into one of those companies on the prior slide until they brought him back. <clears throat> and they uh, reinvigorated the company. My question to you is really, really simple. My question to you is really simple. Do you or do you not want flying toasters? <laughs> I think you do. Let's go back to this plug. So what happened here? We had this plug. It was this plug, and then it became this plug. It's small. The new version's great. You can plug it in either direction on one side. Um, works everywhere on the planet, bonus, unless you're in the UK, in which case you actually need this converter. Um, <laughs> See what's happening again? Um, so my question to you is, when we had this moment, we saw that these new plugs were showing up, what was our actual issue with this? Why did we have this sort of visceral reaction, like a new plug? What? I have to buy everything again. Is the question, Apple is a bunch of greedy bastards and they want us to buy a bunch of new stuff? Absolutely. Well, sure, they probably do. I don't, <laughs> um, I don't think they're greedy bastards, though. The thing is, they were making a choice. They were making a very volatile choice and something that sort of surprised us at the time. And they've been doing it for a lot of years. How many of you remember this guy right here? Yeah, it's a sweet piece of hardware. Right, Stu? Stu, you agree? Really, Android guy? No, OK. Um, <laughs> this is a beautiful piece of hardware. On September 7th, 2005, Steve Jobs got up on stage <clears throat> and he killed this product. At the time, this was the most successful consumer electronics device on the planet, and he killed it. It had been on the market for a year and a half. We couldn't keep him in stock, and he killed it. What in the world was he doing? The MBAs probably lost their flipping minds because the graph was up and to the right. Could not sell them. You couldn't get them in the, you couldn't walk into a store before there were Apple stores, or maybe it was, I forget what. You couldn't get them, and he killed it. What the heck is it? This makes no sense. Added, create a new one, have both of them, make more money. That's not what he did. He decided to kill it because, because he's a volatile. This is clearly not a stable at work because the stable decision would be, would be to add a new product line, make more money. But the thing is, if you go and you look at the introduction, from the introduction of the, of the iPod mini to um, when it was released, this very interesting thing happened which was, if you go look at the competition when they started, it was all this disaster. And by after a year and a half, they all started to kind of look like the, this one right here. He did not want to give the competition time to catch up, so he changed the game. He says, I am going to out-innovate you by getting it out there faster and faster. Again, clearly not a stable at work. They did the same thing with the battery business. The battery business, you guys remember that 17-inch MacBook Pro? We call it the pizza box, right? It was huge. It was great. <laughs> the, uh, they released, I believe, it was a 17-inch MacBook Pro where you couldn't remove the battery, and we nerds lost our flipping minds, right? Because we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I might be on a 17-hour plane flight, and I'm going to need to actually be able to swap this. I, I need to preserve this optionality. I need optionality. I've got to be able to do it. They said no. We're going to give you a battery that's going to last through just about any use case. But more importantly, they got rid of million, million dollar, millions and millions of dollar business because they said embedded batteries was going to be a better model for them. Which is interesting because a couple years later, they put a lot of battery into a little small case. They were actually investing, they were researching how to figure out how to do these cloth based batteries um, inside of the iPhone. But more importantly, the thing that's really important is Apple doesn't want to become stable. They don't want it to like become normal. You can look at the watch and see that they're still trying to do this. I don't want to become stable, by the way, either. You need both of these constituencies in your company, in your team, in your product team. You need the stables there to remind you about reality, to define process, <laughs> whereby large groups of people can be coordinated to actually get work done. This guy is not a designer. He was an engineer, but he's incredibly stable. And he's running the show now. 
They gave him the keys to the whole damn thing. A stable, that's very interesting. Why? Because he's really good at operations. He's really good at making sure that when that thing is out, it's, you, can, you can get it tomorrow, it's worldwide. Stables bring predictability, credibility, and repeatability to your execution. And you need to figure out how to build a world where they can thrive. Volatiles are there to remind you that nothing lasts forever, which is sad. Um, they consider that, they consider it their mission in life to replace that which is inefficient, boring, and uninspired. You need to create a corner of the building where these two groups, um, we need to create a corner where this group in particular can disrupt, and everyone, everyone is clear about the value of this disruption. You need to figure out how to build a world where they can both thrive. <clears throat> and it starts with what I'm doing right now, which is for us to at least have an appreciation um, of the other side of the fence. I like, I, I, I imagine it like this. I imagine um, a stable, a volatile walking over to a stable's office or cube and looking in the stable's cube and going like, wow, it's so tidy. Everything, is, everything has a place and there's this pencil jar. It's just so clean. This is amazing. How do you think in here? It's just so tidy. And then the stable goes over to the volatiles cube, looks in and goes, what a fucking mess. <laughs> this is a disaster. This, I can't even think in here. This, everything's everywhere. This is nuts. Is that a flying toaster? <laughs> When Steve came back to Apple, he built the Beatles, is what this is the story. He bought in everyone. He bought in Sables, he bought in Volatiles, and he figured out how to make them work. The thing you have to be able to do is you have to be willing to throw things away that you cherish. We get really attached to our 1.0s because they were our success. They are the reason the money is coming in, and we love them, and we protect them, and we get stable about them. You have to be willing to at least consider throwing away something that you cherish if you want to continue to innovate. Nature abhors a vacuum. You want to figure out some way in your company to distribute blank slates. At Apple, when Steve came back, he got rid of sabbaticals because he knew what probably everyone else knows. is like what happens with sabbaticals is people tend to say, okay, I get my sabbatical. I'm going to go and I'm going to leave for three months. I'm going to come back and I'm going to quit. <laughs> it's an extended quitting program. <laughs> He's like, I don't want him to quit, so we're not going to let him go. So let's get rid of that. <clears throat> you have to figure out, but it's an important time. You've been working for three years. You've been listening to Rand's, and Rand says, at three years, people are at risk. And I had a list at Palantir. I got a mail six months out from everyone getting in three years. I'm like, oh, Dan. I'm going to go check in on Dan, see how he's doing, right? So what are you going to do? You can't give him a sabbatical. You've got to think of some other way to give them a blank slate. Palantir, we called it the blitz. A blitz was... Someone's getting up to their three-year mark-ish. We give them um, uh, three months or a month, depending on the situation, to do anything they wanted. And they could gather some friends to do it as well. It's like, kind of like 20% time, except a month, two months, three months. Go do whatever you want. Stu, go do flying toasters, right? <clears throat> we do not tell them what to do at all. Over the three or four blitzes that I was looking over, we got two product lines out of that. Now, they could have gone and built ang uh, Angry Birds. They could have done that. They would have been fine. We're like, great, whatever you want to do. But at Palantir, we were creating lines of business with no direction from letting teams go and choose what they want to do within the context of Palantir. It's the power of a blank slate, giving people choice. You need to figure out how to get equal representation and investment in both the stables and the volatiles. Both of these piece parts of the machine are um, essential. <clears throat> if you just have stables, a whole lot gets done, but it's kind of vanilla. If you just have volatile, nothing gets done. It's just craziness. But you have to figure out that balance between the two. To a builder, to folks who build things, Stagnation is death. Volatiles would walk into Oracle or HP or these other companies, and they'd walk in and they'd be like, 
What's that smell? Oh, that's nothing ever getting done because there's always meetings and there's all of this infrastructure. Things like no, it's become it's become a stagnation. To the builder, stagnation is death. Humans are bad. <laughs> at making decisions individually. This is the end result of uncoordinated decision making over just you know decades and decades, obviously. This is where stables rule and the volatiles bail. I'm not saying that a volatile can all solve this problem. Maybe he or she could. But there's a problem to be solved here. There's clearly a design flaw. And I think builders, wherever they might be on the planet, are in a unique position to change the world. Your job is to figure out how you can get these two groups to work together to make sure that they're represented on your team. So you have someone there to coordinate the decision making of these very different people. Because I am 100% certain that we need more flying toasters. Thank you very much. Ah, and I can't work keynote. Oh, and it blew the ending too. That's something we got to do again. Hold on. Oh, wait for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, any questions? Yes. How do you expect a small company or a small team that's very stable and has a uh, volatile in there and does or does ventures? not it has a volatile, mm -hmm. but doesn't have the ability to let that volatile expand because it's not the time and resources. Doesn't have the time to let them expand because of time and resources. Um, hmm. You're stable, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Are you really? Okay. Um, it sounds like a stable question. I think the question is how do you let a, a, a kind of rephrase it, a volatile evolve in a small sort of world? Uh, you don't actually have to worry about them. They're just going to go do it because they do what they want, right? So, uh, like, this idea of like, putting process around them is kind of silly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like these vol that's what they do is they kind of, I, I just wrote about this recently, I call it the wolf. Um, they just kind of go choose their own path, right? And so, like, like saying, like, hey, we're going to point him in that direction or her in that direction, good luck. <laughs> have fun trying to do that. So, I know it's a kind of a trite answer, but it's like, they're going to, a real volatile is going to just kind of, they're going to define their own path. Sorry. Way in the back. I like the idea of the, uh, the blank slate, but how would you apply that to a company of 15 where engineering is, say, seven people? Yeah. Um, it's, it's more of a thing that I think when you have a little bit more um, folks there, we can absorb the cost of someone being offline. I, 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 I turn it into something a little bit smaller, a little less uh, costly. Um, like the hack week concept is another good way to do this, but commit to it, right? Don't call it a hack day. Like, uh, we're doing this, at, we're gonna start doing this at Pinterest. Surprise, Pinterest, if you're listening. Um, <laughs> uh, it was, we're kind of modeling after what we did at, at Palantir, is like really a, a, a full week of the entire team doing this. Start on a Friday, start with the weekend, have a whole week next weekend. So that's really two weeks and the weekend to let people, again, same model, do whatever the hell you want. But like that's something which is not as, as, as a large of a, an effort. But I think this is a sort. I think at any size, taking that time to switch contacts, to step back, go build stuff, think about something else, incredibly healthy for the organism. And it's not just a stable volatile thing. It's just a cadence and like letting folks take a deep breath, right? Yeah. Uh, are you more inspired by Watson or the Apple Watch? <laughs> Am I inspired by Watson or the Apple Watch? Asked by the NBA, I might add. Um, <laughs> Um, the Apple Watch, wow, that's a timely question. I haven't, <laughs> really, seriously, I hate puns. No, that wasn't, I didn't mean to do that. Oh my God, I hate puns. I work at this company called Pinterest and they're really into puns and everything's really Pinteresting. It's awful. Um, the thing about the watch, I think it's the watch and here's why. Um, for Apple products, I'm an Apple fanboy, clearly, um, you got to be able to touch it and actually, that's the thing is, you can see it online and go, God, that's beautiful, but truly the moment is when you pick it up and go like, holy crap, that's just an amazing weight or how it feels in my hand or what the weight reading is. And it's like, I have this feeling that there's this moment coming when I actually like, get to see one of these or touch one of these watches, I'll be like, holy crap. Now, as a big data guy, Watson, a fascinating concept, um, but what has it done? Like, I mean, it's like, tell me the story of like what value is that? Not that a watch is adding a huge value, tell me what time it is and does amazing other things, but that's my initial reaction. Anyway, other questions over, tell me when to stop, by the way. 
Over here, somewhere, over here. Hi. Hi. Um, so when you have, uh, when you get to 1.0 and you've got the volatiles that built 1.0 and they start getting all crusty, uh, or, and the other volatiles come in and start chewing on their leg, and <laughs> then they're kicking them. Love the metaphors. That's and great. then, you know, and then they quit. Yeah. Because that sucks. Yeah. How do you get them not quit, stay on the team, yeah, yeah. shock them back to life, and get yeah. them excited to sort of rejourn, join you, the herd you've got to, It's the blank slate thing. You've got to take them and put them on something. And I, I get it, it's a small company. It's hard to do this. But you got to go and put them on something else. There are these black teams or secret teams at Apple. And shockingly, uh, they were usually started by, wait for it, volatiles, right? <laughs> It's like, hey, uh, let's figure out if we get this OS running on Intel. Like, can you go do that this weekend? Yeah, sure, totally. Right? Um, <laughs> so, it's, again, it's a blank slate concept of like, the, the, you need to get them, the new volatiles, the ones chewing on the leg, love the image, that's interesting. Um, they're going to be cool working on that existing platform or whatever it is. The other ones, go give them something else to go do. Actually, don't. You don't give it to them. They're probably just going to go do it. Allow them to like, hey, go explore other spaces. That's my initial reaction. Another question in the back over there. Hi. Um, yeah. So you had a slide there on flatter organizations, and so that means lots of different things, lots of different people. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of experiments going on now with um, radically flat organizations and this whole like kind of decentralized mindset. And so I was Holacracy, wondering. Holacracy, is what I believe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's Zappos, Valve, Treehouse. You know, yeah, a yeah. lot of them are 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 really really experimenting and going going to extremes. So I was wondering what you felt about that and how that how that really really plays yeah. into to the archetypes. So let's talk about so holacracy is this no management thing. Um, and a medium's doing it. I don't know if uh, Valve aspires to use that word, but it's the same thing. Let's talk about Valve really quickly because they're kind of similar to, to Google in that um, there are these uh, there's these vents in the ceiling at Valve like right here and out comes money just pours out of these vents. <laughs> It's like, oh, look, this money is just pouring out of the vents. Same thing at Google. This money is just pouring out. It's like, wow, this is great. This money that's piling up over here on the floor covers up for a lot of management sin, right? It's, um, there's a lot of, <laughs> you can get a lot of value out of having infinite money. Um, <laughs> you don't have to be very disciplined. You can do lots of experiments. You can do all these things. And that's the thing that I, 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 I haven't, I, I, Zappos is the one I'm really interested because they're the ones I think are large enough and are like, have a crazy enough culture to want to like do this. But like medium, too small, that's still a flat company. Valve, infinite money, Google, infinite money. So these places, not that Google doesn't have managers, but it's in these places where they, there's, they don't have a necessarily a drive to need to have that structure, bureaucracy, management, whatever the hell. It, I, I, I've never, I haven't seen it work yet. Zappos, let's talk about Zappos in a year. Let's get a report card from Zappos in a year after they have tried this and is it really actually something that works. It's fascinating. I love the idea as an engineer to everyone, including Stu here, is just empowered to do whatever they need to do. But there needs to be, some, whether it's project managers, managers, leaders, whatever the hell it is, there needs to be some connective tissue to allow us to communicate and get things done. And this, I have, I, I'd love to see it not work in some other way. I haven't actually seen it yet. If anyone wants to disagree with me, I would love to hear about it. Other questions? So this is probably a broad question, but uh, Agile claims to value uh, process, or people over process. Yeah. And I'm just curious if you find that there's particular value for stables or volatiles or both in an Agile methodology. First off, Agile, great. Scrum, awesome. Uh, but the way that I usually let my teams choose is I let them choose. They can do whatever the hell they want in terms of as long as they are getting the thing done that we agreed we were going to go and do. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of ambivalent. I mean, I'm, it's, I, I, if you read my stuff, I focus on the people. That's like the job. If I don't have people, I have no, exactly no job, <laughs> right? That's my entire problem. So uh, the process is, is as interesting to me as empowering the engineers, the team, the product folks with the right tools, whatever the process is that they need. So, but it is in service of the people, not in service of the process which is the fundamental difference between, one of the fundamental difference between MBAs, sorry, and I think good engineering leaders, my opinion. Other questions? So in a lot of companies, you end up with uh, stables ended up ending up being the engineering managers. Running the show, yeah, it's yeah. a problem. Um, <laughs> how do you fight that? Um, well, you go give talks at conferences. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I've, been, I've been worrying about this quite a bit. I've been trying to find a really good, I've been trying to crack this problem that you're describing. Managers tend to actually be stable because they'd be good at transferring information. They tend to be not as risky. They tend to get things done. They tend to be stable. Um, you have to, there has to be another career track. And this is a good final question. Thank you for asking this. Um, there has to be another career track. And by the way, volatiles even hate that phrasing, which is for these folks. And it puts them, without the management title and the responsibility, it, but it puts them in significant in real positions to influence the company. And by the way, managers like try to build this, the volatiles were run. If, the manager, if it smells at all like a management thing, the volatiles like screw this thing. But we have to figure out some way to create a, a growth path for them, whether it's moving them around. And there's more that we can be doing here because, uh, and not just for volatiles, just for engineers in general, in terms of like really establishing a clear career track for someone who doesn't want to be a manager, but does want to be a leader. Right, and does want to do that. And that's something that we haven't done a good job at because the managers are in charge and we're working with HR about the process and the promo thing and the blah, blah, blah. And it's just, blah, right? We have to figure out some other way to actually do that. It's something I'm working on at Pinterest right now and it's a fascinating problem. Thank you very much. I'll be around for a while. Thank you very much.